Cohen. I am the I am the president of the ACC San Diego chapter. We're happy to have Richard Zelikoff here. He's a partner at DLA Piper. Richard handles a wide range of litigation matters in securities class action and derivative litigation in both state and federal courts throughout the US. He defends companies throughout the technology and life sciences sectors. Um, and then as part of the firm, we'll be uh, presenting also at our all day MCLE on April 19th. So if you have not signed up for that, please do so. And without further ado, Richard will be presenting on reducing risk of securities litigation. Take it away, Richard. Thanks, Diana. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I know we are, I mean, spring break. There's a solar eclipse to be worried about for next uh, next week. Um, but uh, I, I hope this week you'll find this helpful. And I, I plan on trying to do three things here. Um, one is sort of a high level background on securities litigation so that we understand kind of what we're trying to minimize. I'm sure some of you have been through this, but some may have not. And so I'm just going to try and sort of level set. Then I think we want to understand or need to understand plaintiff's counsel's current uh, playbook. And I think, well, maybe it's, it's appropriate that I'm in, or today I'm in San Diego's, the DLA Piper office in San Diego and Diana's in San Diego, because this is sort of, ground zero of the plaintiff's um, legal bar in securities cases with, you know, Bill Larac having been set up here, starting here, and then also, you know, Robin Skeller continuing. Um, but I'm also going to try and describe, in addition to their current playbook, some of the ways they've sort of pivoted, evolved over time, uh, because it's not static, and then it requires constant vigilance. And then, frankly, the most important part of this will be, you know, the public company any sort of best defenses that we presently have with an understanding that these defenses have to be kept updated um, and improved um, and when there are chances to do that. So just as a quick overview, right? So potential securities class action is, you know, you're, it can be, it really is a stressful and unexpected event. I know um, there are many general counsel chief legal officers of public companies who come from a transactional background. Um, and so just litigation itself isn't something that's innate. Um, it's a securities class action also is sort of different from other litigation, frankly, in that the company C-suite are normally named as defendants. Um, and that, that sort of increases both the level of risk and um, the potential distraction to running the business. And there are large potential damages that are being sought um, in these kinds of cases. So just you know, as a little sort of, you know, the number of filings that, have, that, that exist or that are filed as securities class actions, lawsuits filed as securities class actions, this information comes from Cornerstone. And it really is between 200 and 250 companies that are sued every year. Uh, you know, you can see here sort of a number of years in the not so recent past where there seem or there were many more cases. Um, and this is the this is one of the ways in which the plaintiff securities bar has or had evolved for a short period of time. Um, cases related to public company mergers and acquisitions were at one point filed in Delaware for the most part. Um, the uh, Delaware courts made it more difficult for the plaintiff's law firms to uh, get fees for the benefits that they were providing the company. Um, and so they brought, they transitioned and moved cases to the federal courts as class actions. That's the yellow orange um, blocks here that has uh, changed, though they're still, they have still they are still bringing claims on those uh, on those particular situations just in a different manner. Um, the location of filings, I mean, maybe not surprisingly, 
uh, you basically the the two most common places where where these cases are filed are in the Second Circuit with you know where where, New, where there's New York, and then in the Ninth where we happen to be, um, and that's really the Ninth is always in one or two, and it's really the number of life sciences companies, healthcare companies, and tech companies in the Ninth Circuit result in a, num a large number of lawsuits here. Uh, those companies tend to have more volatile stock prices that results in larger stock price drops on the announcement of negative news, and you uh, thereafter, there's there are lawsuits going to get filed. Um, this is something that I'm, I, 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 there was, this is how to, there is, there are two types of securities cases. I'm sort of, at least on the federal side, there are cases under the 33 act, which relate to initial public and follow on offerings. And then there are cases under the 34 act, uh, which are just about aftermarket trading. There is concurrent jurisdiction um, in state and federal courts for the 33 Act claims, and the 33 Act claims cannot be removed to federal court. Um, and uh, there was a point in time where the plaintiff's bar decided that they wanted to bring their 33 Act cases in state court. Uh, because the standards uh, to to survive motions to dismiss or demurs if you're in California uh, was was easier than it was in federal court. And um, frankly, there uh, you can say, well, why did this start happening or why was there sort of this increase in 2015, 16, etc.? Um, there was a former plaintiff side lawyer who was appointed to the a, a the complex panel in San Mateo, uh, and so the plaintiffs thought this would be a good place to bring those claims. Um, the defense bar we've we have figured out ways to redirect these cases into federal court, where they uh, get the scrutiny, the appropriate scrutiny, in, in my opinion, um, though not, not, not all of them. And this is really an issue where, um, frankly, some companies did not adopt what is what is a, a forum selection bylaw provision allow mandating that 33 act uh, cases get filed in um, federal court. And this, to me, is, I guess, an area where the companies who are being, who have been sued in state court um, just didn't, didn't adapt quickly enough or uh, in, in sort of adopting one of those bylaws. And you might say, you know, well, that's just sort of... <laughs> Maybe it's a company represented by, you know, a smaller corporate firm that, that sort of, or a smaller company. Um, well, one of those, because I know I'm in, I'm involved in it, is uh, Silicon Valley Bank, where we had lawsuits filed in state court, and it is uh, creating significant complexities, and they were so. It's it's not just sort of a, a smaller company that isn't paying attention to it, but it does mean that everyone needs to be vigilant and and adapt. Um, here are the sort of the costs of settlement. Again, information from Cornerstone over time. Um, you know, the median is always lower than the average because there are some uh, out. Well, people call them outliers. You know, large large settlements. Um, they're outliers until they happen to you, um, you know, and that's that's sort of something that I think we'll I'll talk about in a little bit, keeping in mind. Also, these I think these numbers understate a few things. One, they understate because they do not include uh, the attorney's fees to defend these cases. Um, I guess that's that's a difficult thing for me to cover because I guess I am those attorneys fees in certain situations and um, that so that's one thing and then there's also just 
the aggravation and distraction of these cases uh, goes, I think, beyond the um, the the fees or the amounts incurred, and the amounts are not inconsequential either. So, moving to the next slide, what is a securities class action? I mean, it's. I think most of you probably are aware. You know, it's basically, frankly, any time you have a substantial stock price drop, um, there is a high likelihood that a plaintiff's law firm, and I'll discuss brief in a little bit how they uh, go about bringing these claims or how they go about coming up with how to bring these claims, um, will sue claiming that uh, you whatever information you disclosed that caused the stock price to drop was something you knew and should have disclosed um, earlier, uh, and your failure to do so constitutes uh, fraud. Um, I have a very different view on that, but I think that's probably slightly beyond uh, what we're going to cover. Um, though, I guess I should add is that I come to these cases from the perspective of I really do not believe that corporate executives um, and members of the board of directors are ever actually trying to uh, affirmatively defraud on their stockholders, um, things happen, and uh, that's that's sort of you know stock prices fall. Um, but that the plaintiff's bar views these as all sort of indications of fraud. Um, and what kind of statements can plaintiffs base their claims? It's basically everything. I mean, anything that might be viewed as directed to investors. Uh, can become the basis for a claim of securities fraud. Um, I mean, there was a very short period of time uh, where, you know, courts were dismissing uh, statements made in ESG reports. Um, and you can sometimes get that to happen, but, you know, ESG reports are, well, you're directing them to investors. Uh, now those statements are also at issue. And frankly, um, I don't know, many of you might have received comments from uh, Corp Fin, the SEC division of Corp Fin uh, last year saying, hey, how come you've got all this information about your ESG issues in an ESG report, but it's not in something more formal? And frankly, I think that is also one of the reasons why uh, the SEC issued their climate disclosure uh, uh, rules. Well, they finally issued them after uh, considering them for two years. Um, the, tames, the claims that are most common, I already sort of mentioned this and described sort of where the two, the, the different situations in which they arise. Um, the 10B claims, these are the aftermarket claims. Um, there are the, these claims are in some ways harder to assert for the plaintiff's bar um, because they must allege intentional fraud, which is knowledge or recklessness in the Ninth Circuit. That's deliberate recklessness and other circuits. Uh, it, it's sort of a lower standard of recklessness, but it's it's still uh, it's more than just knowledge. And they have some other things they have to allege uh, that have are have, have, were enacted by Congress in 1995 uh, and have actually been an incredibly beneficial way of, of helping uh, re eliminate and, and get most many of these cases dismissed and even a number of cases not being brought before 95 every forward looking statement projection case that you that a company missed was 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 ultimately <laughs> brought as the securities case and that uh changed to some extent with the reform act so the 30, section 11 and 12 are under the 33 act the so the the 
negative of these types of claims is that they are strict liability claims. There is no obligation for the plaintiff to allege or prove scienter, but they are limited to statements made in registration statements and prospectuses for public stock offerings. Um, and the plaintiff must actually establish that uh, he, she, it bought shares in this the particular offering. But a, a difficult thing to do when uh, you when you already have shares publicly traded and you're doing sort of a secondary, very easy to do um, if it's your IPO and uh, you're you you go forward with a traditional underwritten IPO. Uh, defendants, other than the issuer, do have an affirmative due diligence defense, which let's call that negative scienter. I, I did my job or I did what I needed to do and didn't find any obvious errors, but that is not something that can be brought in connection with sort of the earliest stages of a case. Um. So here's a sample timeline on sort of how a securities class action uh, proceeds. And I, I think what is, there are a couple things that I kind of want, did want to point out here. Uh, and, and the first is that you are, you, you know, it's not like when you have a securities class action filed under the federal securities laws, it isn't the situation where that lawsuit is filed and you are immediately sort of off to the races. Your, in all likelihood, your first response, formal response to, to the uh, lawsuit is not going to be due until about six months uh, until after that initial complaint. Um, but I also would want to say is that you can't, you, and I'll get into this a little later, you shouldn't just be sitting on your hands doing nothing during that six month uh, period. There are many things that companies should be doing in that time period uh, to get ahead of what is, you know, what's, what's, what's coming. Um, and the other part of this, this is it, you're not likely to get a decision on a motion to dismiss uh, at least for quite a while. So it requires a little bit of patience as well. You you and this lawsuit, while maybe not as you know being aggressively pursued for that first year, is something that as if you're general counsel, I expect your the executives named are going to be, well, why isn't this done yet? Why am I still named? This whole thing is rubbish. Um, and just procedurally uh, that this is the way these things um, uh, move. Um, this, uh, I, I guess I, I, I briefly mentioned the Reform Act of 95 earlier. This really is something that without we, there would be many more securities cases. There would be many more securities cases that were, that survived, um, got passed a motion to dismiss. Um, and frankly, maybe the most important part of this is that there is an automatic stay on discovery until the court has determined that the plaintiff has stated a claim. So you're not in a situation like it used to exist, which is a plaintiff would just file a lawsuit and then, you know, 20 days later be issuing uh, document requests that um, would be burdensome and annoying, of course, before 1995. Um, we we weren't all using email uh, at a the rate and other various uh, electronic communications, so the volume of documents wasn't as high, but they they were able to get them sort of immediately. Um, there was also an attempt in the Reform Act to 
uh, eliminate sort of this race to the courthouse where someone tries to file a lawsuit sort of first to take the lead and lawyer driven litigation. And that has had there is some success, at least in terms of eliminating the race to the courthouse. Um, but in terms of lawyer driven litigation, there are uh, I can sort of. It, it hasn't quite worked out that way. And there are other ways in which this elimination of the race to the courthouse is something that the plaintiff's bar has evolved to address. Um, I do want to bring up securities class actions are no longer really sort of isolated, you know, single litigations. The same set of circumstances will often sort of result in sort of a multi-front uh, attack on the company um, with, so one, one of those, those attacks is a derivative lawsuit, which is unlike a securities class action, which, which is brought by the stockholders in their capacity as stockholders, and they are seeking damages for themselves. Um, a derivative lawsuit is brought on behalf of the company and uh, by a, a, a stockholder saying that the executives harmed the company and should be making payments, doing something to the company. Um, you, you, these used to be it really up until the last five years ago, I, I, they used to be sort of just these tag along derivative cases where you would really only focus on the securities class action as defense counsel and as as the company. And then once you'd sort of addressed the securities class action, you would agree to some, let's call it corporate governance changes in response to the derivative case and a relatively small payment to the plaintiff's lawyers um, for the benefit that they have provided in obtaining those corporate governance changes. That's really, uh, that's changed significantly in the last five years. And basically, eight of the 10 largest derivative settlements have taken place or have occurred in the last in the 2020s, and all of these uh, were over $150 million. So we are not talking, you know, corporate governance changes in the $500,000 fee. We're talking there's real risk there. Uh, there are particularly different procedures there that, um, you know, normally you can have the same counsel who's defending you in the securities class action address these, though sometimes uh, that has to, to change. And I think a big difference that that I guess many people don't recognize between derivative lawsuits and securities class actions is that the company cannot indemnify individual defendants, board members, executives for settlement of derivative lawsuits. Uh, the courts view that as sort of the, the company paying itself. Um, and so there are that has to be thought through kind of carefully in, in how someone defends the, the these litigations. Um, another sort of let's call it front that whereby uh, companies are attacked now when they were not uh, in the not so distant past are books and records demands. Um, this has become both. It's both in and of itself a a complication, and then they also end up being those demands be a precursor to a more detailed stockholder derivative suit that is much more likely to uh, get passed or so get through a motion to dismiss. Um, and frankly, the Delaware courts keep. Um, reducing the defenses that issuers have in response to these 220 demands such that we are almost at the place where um, you 
essentially have to turn over your formal board materials, your minutes and books in response to a 220 demand. And that if those board minutes and books with the Delaware courts will call sort of formal board materials are in adequate in sort of how they describe board decision making processes um, and or uh, th then one, um, the plaintiff's lawyers are likely to be able to get more detailed information such as emails, etc. And also the, the items missing from a from board minutes, the Delaware courts in the subsequent derivative lawsuits will be holding or stating that, um, well, it's not in the minutes, so it must not have been discussed. So in this, let's, I'm sort of, I don't know wh where to bring this up in terms of ways to avoid. You can't avoid the books and records demands generally, but what you can do is make sure that your minutes are more full so that you can avoid the the consequences that follow from from lack thereof. I mean, uh, when I started practicing, and all all board minutes were, you know, the company discussed competition. Questions were asked, and discussions ensued, or the company discussed uh, compliance with FDA regulations. Questions asked, and discussions ensued. Uh, you can't do that anymore. Um, it just will. It's like leading with your chin, um, and you have you have to do something more about that. Um, you know, you can also. I mean, this is another front in these battles. I mean, it's not the plaintiffs' law firms, but it is. But it's it's sort of something similar. Um, the SEC. Uh, I don't know if anyone. Well, I don't know if anyone was at SEC weeks yesterday in DC or participated online. Um, they're just becoming more and more aggressive and more and more aggressive in what they expect companies to do in order to um, generate cooperation credit with the SEC. Uh, you know, we'll see if there's an administration change, whether that continues, but that's where we currently stand. All right, so uh, moving on to something sort of uh, maybe a little more, this is basically, we've, we've gone over, you know, what the basics are at the high level. The plaintiff's law firms have a playbook. It's, it's you know, it gets modified at from time to time. Um, but, and it doesn't always follow this, but uh, I think it's important that companies sort of understand this playbook because without knowing the playbook, you might not sort of understand how some of the responses that we're going to talk about apply. Um, and so I, these things sort of go from, let's call it left to right, and then, you know, uh, and circle around. Um, but th they can move in different ways as well. And, um, you know, one of the increasing areas is, uh, in terms of a plaintiff's playbook is, uh, the partnering with short sellers, um, uh, you know, activist short sellers who sort of out of nowhere will issue reports that are seemingly well-researched and um, take a very negative position on the company in and of themselves, they are, will, will sometimes cause uh, a stock price decline by themselves. And that would then result in a lawsuit. There are also, you know, the, the SEC and has had a whistleblower program uh, for a while. The, uh, DOJ just recently announced this year their own sort of whistleblower program that uh, is another way, not necessarily the same plaintiff's law firm that might sue you, but one of the same groups of law firms uh, might represent whistleblowers, and that could then um, uh, end up causing the SEC or someone to start looking at you. Uh, the plaintiff's bar, they just 
you know, they look for any stock price decline. I, I used to say that the number was 5%, but I've seen lawsuits, investigations um, that are, are e even lower numbers than that. Um, and then they they will announce an investigation, which and I put investigation in quotes because uh, I really think of it as more just an effort to find a stockholder to lend his her its name to a lawsuit. And this is something, you know, I mentioned earlier that the uh, the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act attempted to avoid or limit the race to the courthouse and limit uh, lawyer-driven litigation. But the plaintiffs and the plaintiff's bar has essentially co-opted some of those provisions that were supposed to be protective of companies um, and, and use them to their advantage. So uh, the Reform Act requires the plaintiff to first file, who first files a lawsuit to issue an announcement of that lawsuit so that others, uh, the plain, other relevant plaintiffs who might have more of a stake so that it isn't lawyer-driven litigation can move to be lead plaintiff. Um, but, and then that evolved, so that does happen, but that evolved into, or devolved depending on your perspective, uh, plaintiffs, you know, the first, you only need one notice, but you would then have subsequent plaintiffs law firms issuing notices saying, you know, not we filed a lawsuit, but uh, the clever use of the passive voice, a lawsuit has been filed and we are investigating it. Um, and then that has even further devolved into even before anyone has sued, uh, a, the plaintiff's law firms, frankly, you, you can even see these investigations uh, being, uh, these investigation notices being uh, issued with, you know, intraday drops. Um, uh, and they're basically just trying to find someone to lend their name to the lawsuit. Uh, if they find someone, they will literally scour all your public filings for any statement made that is vaguely related to the um uh to to the subject of what caused the stock price to drop um and so basically and that's what then and, and they would do that they do that they then, uh, that lawsuit is a placeholder lawsuit that really has, it's, it's, it's kind of a nothing. It doesn't, doesn't really say much other than, hey, look, you, you made these statements and then you made this statement and now, uh, so I'm suing you for securities fraud. And now I have, you know, there's going to be a period by a lead plaintiff being appointed, a period when uh, I'm going to file an amended complaint. Um, and in the interim, I am going to be, I, plaintiff lawyer, uh, I am going to be investigating these claims. I am going to contact former employees of the company. I'm going to contact current employees, even if I'm not supposed to do that. I'm going to contact your customers because um, I am going to find as much information as possible uh, to file a consolidated complaint that is um, much stronger than uh, the sort of placeholder that I have uh, uh, filed. Um, you know, you'll then have others who may maybe have not had as much luck or have, have uh, found a stockholder only who has a small loss who will then, because the, the size of the loss is not relevant when it comes to derivative suits, demand letters, books and records. Uh, they'll start sending things as well and not just, you know, one or two. You you can sometimes have, I mean, it, it crosses double digits at times. And, you know, the goal is extract settlement value, basically. Um, so here's sort of, I call this the before timeline, the timeline that exists now, 
right? For for a lot of companies, you you, you haven't you don't have an issue presently that you're worried about um, that might cause a stock price drop. Um, but then continue through through sort of you know coming to learn of that issue, public disclosure of that issue, stock price drop, the plaintiffs' law firms issuing notices of investigation. Um, and 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 so on. Sort of, it overlaps a little bit with the the timeline uh, that I that that I had earlier. Um, you do have the securities laws do give you sort of a reasonable time to investigate when you become you know so that when there's an internal knowledge of an issue, so you're not sort of you know all right, I just found about this. I have to file my eight K right away. I mean, there are some exceptions, including, you know, the new rules about cyber uh, uh, breaches. Um, but I want to sort of now talk about what we should be doing or what companies should be doing in each of these various, during this, the, the, these these time frames where uh, at, at different, what, where you've got some, some time. So, what should you a company do before it faces any issues that might result in a stock price drop? Um, so the, the the first step I'm going to just call it you know your corporate documents. Um, the the at present we are allowed and and should have to modify bylaws to include a forum selection provision designating the place of your incorporation uh, for lawsuits involving corporate internal affairs. Uh, this means basically you can uh, get all derivative suits filed against you in um, a single place, the place where the company is incorporated. It's much less chaotic to defend derivative cases in a single jurisdiction rather than and in a single court where they can all be uh, coordinated and consolidated rather than trying to um, balance multiple cases in multiple places that might be moving at different uh, different speed and um, creating problems. Um, you can adopt a forum selection provision designating a federal court for claims under the 33 Act. Not only does this avoid sort of the multiplicity of lawsuits, um, and not only do, I, I, I mean, I, I laugh because I actually have two, I'm sort of laughing. I have two cases currently where they the companies did not adopt those provisions and um, in the one I said was Silicon Valley Bank, we've figured out a different way to remove um, and plaintiff's motion to remand was denied. But in the other, we are in state court and state courts just do not have the same procedural protections as federal courts in these lawsuits. Um, you don't have to plead with particularity uh, in state court. You do not get you do not necessarily get the benefit of uh, the discovery stay while a motion to dismiss um, is pending. Um, you also don't always have judges that are as familiar with securities cases. And um, there have been academic studies or the, the likelihood of getting a case dismissed that's a 33 Act case filed in state court dismissed um, on a demurrer motion to dismiss is a lot lower than it is in federal court. Um, next sort of thing to do is, you know, protect your directors and officers from good faith mistakes. Uh, I think most companies at this point have, if you're a Delaware corporation, say there are uh, have a provision that there's no money damages for alleged breaches of the duty of care for directors. Uh, Delaware two years ago allowed a similar provision to be adopted for officers, though with some not quite as broad as for directors. Uh, people were worried about 
sort of presenting that to their stockholders because they thought ISS or Glass Lewis might make negative comments about that. That has not been an issue. So, um, you know, protect your protect your officers as well. Um, and I say that especially with, with the there has been an increase in the number of sort of duty of care cases filed against officers um, that uh, and with courts holding they have the same fiduciary duties as directors. Um, I, I, I'm going to guess or think that most of you um, have these policies in place already. But what I have learned over time is you put someone may have put all these policies in place four or five years ago and has not or have not um, brought them up to sort of the state of the art. Um, and it is so, you know, you're like, oh, I've checked these these boxes off. I, I can not worry about this anymore. Um, I just don't think that's the way these things need to be thought about. And it is, uh, I think it behooves you to ask uh, counsel, hey, have there been any changes in some of these things such that we should update uh, them? Um, I mean, you know, your insider trading policy is one, for example, you know, you're going to have to publish it next year basically it's this is a good time to look back at it and make sure not just that it's state of the art but that you're going to be comfortable having it um subject to public scrutiny um you know there have been there were changes in the 10b51 plan rules obviously you're going to respond to those but need to think about how those rules also impact your insider trading policy um, especially with respect to sort of executive tax planning, because uh, with the um, the cooling off periods into the 10B51 plans, that that if you make 10B51 plans mandatory, uh, that's going to make it harder for people to engage in sort of tax planning at the end of the year. So something to another just a thing to think about: articles, bylaws, agreements. Um, again, these these the the indemnification and advancement provisions, um, and and the law, the case law, applicable there to changes. And so sometimes that makes sense to look at the articles, bylaws, and agreements to make changes to those as well. You know, DNO insurance. Um, this is you know what. How, what during there are hard markets for DNO insurance and soft markets for D insurance, and uh, I understand D insurance is not not free and not cheap. Um, but I have found recently that I think there are, for one reason or another, companies do not seem to have. They seem to be a little underinsured. Um, uh, just, you know, you, and that's something to think about. Maybe what is missing is there's an, a sort of a, a disconnect between the, the fact that there are going to be attorney's fees, um, that help that reduce, you know, limits that you, you're able to have for other, otherwise, um, I, I think you probably know that you know, insurance, um, their duty to advance, not uh, not duty to indemnify policies, so that in, that defense fees come out of those. Um, just another thing to to keep in mind. Risk disclosures are. I I honestly think that this is something companies. I know companies spend a lot of time on it. I think it's something you should spend even more time on and really think about how we're tailoring them um, 
to the to your specific risks as they have changed over time. Um, and I really the other thing I, I I've put this here. I guess I should have maybe made not bigger. Uh, I, there's this tendency, or at least I've seen this tendency to. You kind of want to include your mitigating factors in your risk disclosures. You know, there's a risk of uh, FDA non-approval, but, you know, we've had wonderful communications with the FDA thus far. Uh, it just sort of, I think, defeats the purpose of the risk disclosures and makes them um, more potentially subject to what I've got is the, the last bullet point on this one, which is, this is another way where plaintiffs have evolved, um, whereby they, uh, you know, risk disclosures are designed or intended to protect the company. Um, they're designed to provide, you know, the ability to, pro to, to offer forward-looking information without increased risk of liability. And the plaintiff's lawyers have uh, they st they they started by arguing that a risk factor disclosure cannot be meaningful for purposes of the safe harbor if you know of uh, the risk um, that has already occurred, um, and then they uh, pivoted or improved upon that to arguing that a risk disclosure a risk factor disclosed as a hypothetical is misleading in and of itself if the risk has already occurred uh it is you know so they go from absolving you from liability to actually increasing your potential liability um there is a cert petition currently before the supreme court on this issue, uh, the Supreme Court hasn't taken cert on it yet, um, but hopefully this gets, they quote, they fix this, uh, but I just, we don't know. Uh, I actually, I've, I've written something that should be coming out in the next, I don't know, a month or so on this issue that uh I'm sure will be ignored, but nonetheless, I, I, it's sort of how how I think about these things, um, risk disclosures. Um, you know, uh, this I know everyone does really try and do each of these things, um, and they're not always easy. Uh, number two is one that I find real sort of some real issues with, you know, your your executives will go to uh, conferences and, and speak as part of fireside chats and otherwise, and are to some extent relying on sort of a forward-looking statement disclaimer made by the bank or the analyst in advance. Um, unfortunately, sometimes those, those what the bank analyst dis, uh, disclaimers don't make it into the transcripts and you can then um, sort of lose the protection of the safe harbor that way. Uh, so just something to keep in mind um, when, when, when you have people doing that. Also, you know, earnings calls, Q and a, obviously, I mean, this is uh I guess this is managing managing your C-suite. Uh, I know we they many many C-suite executives who are speaking on these calls uh, have obviously, as they should, because they're managing the organization, have an optimistic view as to what we what the company can accomplish. Um, but sometimes that uh, uh, gets gets translated into um, absolute statements that uh, may not actually be accurate and may not actually reflect what what you know is really going on um, so that's there um protecting company information um on board you know NDAs appropriate trading NDAs with with former employees 
And this is, I kind of want to talk a little bit here about former employees because they actually become um, one of your biggest risks in connection with securities uh, class actions. Um, each of the large plaintiffs law firms um, have, they have investigators on staff and they also hire outside private investigators who will figure out through various techniques, um, LinkedIn is an easy one, who former employees, who your former employees are, and they will call them to ask for information um, that they then can use in uh, not that placeholder complaint, which is just a placeholder, but in the amended complaint. And um, NDA and uh, NDAs with departing employees are one way to reduce the likelihood that those former employees um, make negative statements or, you know, talk to these plaintiffs investigators. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about there are other things we can do there, too. Um, you know, engaging in monitoring stakeholders is an important aspect of reducing your risks. I mean, one, it means that they are less likely to be surprised by a negative development that thereafter, you know, so reduces the likelihood of stock price drop, um, but it also then reduces the likelihood of you know, an analyst report that says management <laughs> shocked us. So this came as a huge surprise to us, uh, which then can be used subsequently in in securities class action uh, consolidated complaints. Um, you know, there's some things that you just you you can't. You know, short seller reports come out of nowhere. Uh, they don't tend to provide the company with an opportunity uh, for comment. They tend to publish during quiet periods in an effort to create, wreak, you know, the most havoc. Um, I, I think, oh, they didn't put this, I wanted, oh, well, I wanted a picture of the uh, Game of Thrones painted table here for, for tabletop exercises, but I guess that was going to violate uh, copyright, so it didn't happen. Um, but that's something, uh, you know, run through these things before they happen so that you're you're in a place to to deal with them. Um, moving on to sort of a different time in the in the, you know, between the event and disclosure uh, investigation, I I guess I'm a litigator, so I think you should uh, involve litigators in um, public dis in reviewing your public disclosures. Uh, helps frame the narrative going forward, and then there's a question about disclosing early. Uh, if you do get sued, um, there are a number of things to do. I mean, one, make sure you connect with your DNO insurance partners. Can help. Uh, you know, they're repeat players. They can help direct you. Um, make sure that your board obviously knows and the auditors too, uh, board members, not just because you want to keep them updated, uh, they might be named as defendants and, and uh, the plaintiff's law firms might be running around trying to serve them, which is no one really enjoys having a process server show up at their uh, at their home. Um, implement a lit litigation document hold. Uh, that's, uh, I think, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, inform and assure current employees, people may be worried about their jobs, people may be worried about what this means for them. Um, I also think that can be done in connection with both a document hold and then also a reminder uh, of their duties of confidentiality. This is the former employee side is something where, I, I mean, you know, I think there are there are ways to contact former employees uh, that reduce the likelihood that they're going to cooperate with plaintiffs' lawyers. Um, I've learned this sometimes the hard way. One case, uh, I actually sent formal emails, or I guess it was memos to those former employees. Um, 
that became discoverable and was not the, the smartest uh, decision I made in defending a litigation, but I've gotten better and I uh, can, you know, can work through those things. Um, and then I said, I, I'm, I'm jumping. I've realized I've, I've maybe spent a little more too much time on the, the background. Um, you know, between that time period, that placeholder complaint and a consolidated complaint, there's 180 days. And I think a lot of uh, companies sort of just sit there and say, well, we'll just wait for the amended complaint and then figure out how we're going to uh, address, deal with that. I think that's a, it, it is a, it is a big mistake. Um, I, as I said, you know, you want to, I think you want to get your litigator involved right before you're going to, or before you announce negative information um, to help frame a narrative or reframe the narrative that is going to develop from the plaintiff side. And for you, people to learn the client's, I call it the client's story here, but I really view it as the truth um, so that you 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 are able to then um put that truth before the court in connection with a motion to dismiss or otherwise um and there are you can do this not just you know in the immediate aftermath of learning something but um, in your subsequent disclosures as well. And then I write here, I don't know, judicial notice and incorporation by reference, just very briefly. Motions to dismiss in securities cases, you are not really allowed to put in evidence. That's the nature of um, a motion to dismiss. Uh, but there are these various judicial doctrines, judicial notice and incorporation by reference, whereby uh, information that may be publicly available um, can be used in the motion to dismiss and can be used to help actually uh, tell the client's story. And so but finding those documents uh, and is something that should be done not in that 180 days uh, so that you're 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 ready and able to uh, this, which is tell the client's story in your motion to dismiss. I mean, it is all framed around you know the case law and legal argument um but that case law and legal argument only gets you so far and uh the client story um in terms of creating an alternative narrative humanizing the defendants and providing comfort to the court so that he she is willing to not just think about well this doesn't meet the technical requirements of the Reform Act, but I'm real comfortable that there really wasn't anything untoward occurring. Makes, I think, you know, judges are people too, uh, much more likely to dismiss a case um, than not. Um, and I think I, well, that's the end of formal, and I have left you exactly one minute for questions, though I'm always available afterwards to provide, you know, to answer additional questions should you uh, want to reach out. Thanks, Richard. I don't um, see any questions in the chat, but again, as Richard mentioned, please reach out to him directly if you have any questions. Otherwise, thank you so much, Richard. And uh, we will see everyone soon, hopefully. So much. Thanks for having me.